the project I want to update you on today started back in 2014 uh, with some paddock level trials quantifying the production effects for maternal type sheep with different nutrition through pregnancy and lactation. The, the project hit a few snags in taking that into the feed budgeting phase in order to develop the, the guidelines so it's taken a little bit longer to to hit the road than, than was originally expected. Those snags were associated with not being able to get the feed budget based on the Australian feeding standards to mimic what was measured in the, in the paddock. So we had to go back and, and have a look why that was. Was it intake? Was it associated with maintenance requirement? Was it associated with efficiency of, of live weight gain? So, so those things have been um, sorted out in the last couple of years and the project the, the final report will be delivered in the next um, in the next month or so. So this is uh, still reasonably hot off the press. But as as Leanne mentioned, the the sort of genesis of this project was associated with with lifetime new management and the, the pushback that um, that Leanne mentioned, and and so this was the, the the research and the outcomes to to develop maternal condition score uh, guidelines for, for meat, meat sheep. So the, the lifetime new management guidelines for merinos was to, to join, or, or the, the main target was, was lambing, and, um, but it was to join ewes in condition score three, uh, and then lamb the, the single bearing ewes in, in about the same condition, and then have twin bearing ewes 0.3 uh, of a condition score better than the than the singles, and if if green feed was available, then the recommendation was to lose if green feed was available in the lead up to, to lambing, to allow some weight loss in in early pregnancy and put the the condition back on in in late pregnancy using that green feed, and if you were lambing onto dry feed, then to maintain those ewes from from joining through to lambing. Um, and, and those targets have, or, and the, the lifetime new management training course has been delivered to um, around 4,000 producers and up, upwards of 12 million ewes for those uh, in those in those flocks. And follow-up surveys have shown that those producers who have attended lifetime new management have uh, increased weaning percentage by on average 7%. They've increased their stocking rate by around one DSE per hectare, and they've reduced their ewe mortality by by one percent. So it's been a, a fairly impactful project, and and so there it was deemed to be worthwhile doing something for maternals, and, and hence the the project lifetime maternals. And and the reasoning was that that around a quarter of the the national ewe flock is is maternal um, or, or meat based, non-merino based, uh, and almost 50% of the lambs that go to slaughter are, are from those non-merino ewes. And there was the, the condition score targets that were developed for the merino ewes were being extrapolated out to what might be the case for, for the non-merino ewes, and, and the people doing the extrapolation were coming up with, with varying answers, so hence the, the farmers were were saying, well, we need the actual research done. Um, and the lifetime U analysis showed that there, that having those, um, having those targets was having a big impact on profitability. So the, the project that was conceived and, and experiment one and experiment two were the, the initial um, experiments. They were on farm, paddock scale trials looking at experiment one was nutrition during um, pregnancy, so from, from joining through to lambing and generated uh, a range of condition scores during that period and there was, there was four treatments and the, the, la or the animals were put back together again just post lambing. In the second experiment there was two treatments during uh, pregnancy and then a range of treatments of different foo um, from just prior to lambing to, to see where there was an effect of foo during lactation on, 
on weaning weight and, and also on lamb survival. So those sites, there was, there was four sites in that phase of the project, um, two in Victoria, one in South Australia and one in Western Australia. Mostly they were with a composite uh, type maternal sheep well, of different, different composite breeds and the, the Strawn um, site was using Bordelester Merinos. The experiment three and experiment four had to be added in to, to sort of get around the roadblock that was was hit and and that involved some intensive management or intensive measurement of, of feed intake which happened at, at uh, Strawn on, on pasture and then in the feed shed at Hamilton and at uh, Katanning where animals were were measured for feed intake and then they were also scanned with a DEXA scan to, to look at, at levels of fat and protein in the body to get a, a better idea of what was happening to the energy that was consumed. So there was some, some new results and what I want to run through first is, is some of the production information that was, was gleaned and then look at what the, the guidelines or the condition score recommendations uh, so, so the way the statistical analysis was carried out, um, the, there was a, a statistical analysis of the data that was generated to, to provide a statistical model to help predict from a range of inputs uh, different types of production. So what, what's on the, on the board here is, a, is an estimate of, of scanning percentage in, in fetuses per 100 ewes uh, related to condition score at, at joining and the, the top line is the prediction that you would have expected or the prediction that was was generated prior to knowing the extra information that was generated in in this uh, in this experiment and the way you could look at that <coughs> because what what this experiment showed was that the way the animal gets to the condition score at joining affects the impact on scanning percentage or, or conception. And, and so that is if, if animals, if the ewes pre-joining started at the same point and then you fed them out to different joining condition scores, what's the impact on, on scanning percentage? So that's the, the type of um, figures that, that had been generated in the past and and that's the the top line that's ignoring the profile the the middle line is if we take into account that that the way the animal the way the ewe has or the nutrition of that ewe prior to joining for the 12 months prior to joining uh, affect scanning we get and this is more akin to what happens on farm if people gen aim for high condition score or low condition score at joining, they've tended to have done that last year as well. And, and that shows when, when, the, when the research has been done and the relationships have been developed, following that sort of process is less responsive to having higher condition score at joining than, than this sort of research that have been done in the past. And then the third line, you follow a system like this. So this is the previous joining, this is the previous lambing and that's next joining. So if, if you have a, a target for lambing and then you feed up more for joining and then you lose next in the in the pregnancy period next year you lose for joining and then feed back up again in the post weaning period then then that is even less responsive again. So, so this is sort of new information that um, that you probably haven't seen before, but it helps quantify um, some of what we're seeing and it helps explain why when we have a poor season, I've got to go back to the board again, um, if you have a poor season and you start heavy at last year's joining, which was a normal year, then you have a failed spring and you drop down to, to this year's joining, that that's actually worse than having done that but on the flip side if you've had you've coming off the poor year and then you go back up to next year's joining after of having a normal season that you'll actually be that point 
will be actually much better than that point. So, so between seasons, you, it actually explains why the impact of the poor season is more than you expect and the recovery back to the next season is more than you expect. So when you're coming off a poor season, you expect a bumper lambing or a bumper conception at least, depends on your lamb survival whether you get a bumper lambing, um, but it helps explain some of what we see in the industry statistics that, that jump up and down much more uh, than you'd expect even from, uh, even from this line here. So similar to lifetime new management, the, there was a response of um, survi lamb survival to, to birth weight and the 2014 result said that there was no difference in the response for twin lambs and single lambs. With the 2015 information included, there actually is a, a, a slight difference between singles and twins, um, but it's, it's relatively small most of the effect is, is, due to, uh, is due to live weight. With the, with the extra information that was, that was generated from the 2015 trial, which included variation in foo at lambing, um, it showed that there was no effect of, of foo at lambing. It was, it was associated with, with, with birth weight and you couldn't overcome low birth weight by, by having high foo and that wasn't really what we expected, but that's what, uh, that's what came out. And there was a small effect of U condition score independent of birth weight, but it was a relatively small effect. It was only about a 2% increase. The, the optimum was around uh, three, a condition score three at lambing. If you were at condition score three and a half or condition score two and a half, then you dropped around one and a half percent. Um, for that change in condition score. So it's a, a relatively small effect. So it's really saying that, that even with um, the maternal type breeds, it, it's all about birth weight as far as lamb survival goes. So comparing, comparing that with the, with the, green, uh, sorry, the green line was the 2014 results. The previous graph was combined and that'll be significant in a second. Uh, but it shows that the maternal sheep are a bit, the maternal lamb is a bit more robust than the merino lamb and, and I guess we all expect that to be the case but this just puts some, some numbers on it. The bit that we, the statisticians spent a fair bit of time on was, was looking at this effect of um, high birth weights and dystochia. So there was an expectation that, that heavy, it was easy for uh, maternal ewes to produce such a heavy single born lamb that you'd have problems with dystochia. And, and this definitely didn't show up in the 2014 results. Including the 2015 results, that line dropped down a little as you saw in the previous slide. If we included the variation in the results between, so if we put error bars around those relationships, there was, there was more variation out here than there was um, back there, um, but um, it still doesn't really fit in with, th this, in, this is an individual animal statistical analysis and, and it was very difficult to, to, get the, um, to, to get that statistical analysis to, to line up with the expectations, whereas the, the, plot, the plot level information lines up much more closely with, with what was expected as far as um, the impact of high conditions or high birth weight on, on single lamb survival. So as we move out from sort of condition score three to, to high threes, then the, there is a reduction in, or it was observed that there was a reduction at the plot level in lamb survival and that, that it was statistically significant. Um, but the individual animal analysis, which is a bit more powerful and a bit more useful as far as when we want to do feed budgeting and, and do some calculations, that information seemed to disappear through the cracks. And, and as, a, as an economist, it was hard to understand where it disappeared to and why the statistician um, had lost it. And he used lots of big words that um, 
meant a lot to him but didn't seem to mean a lot to us. And, and, and that comes back to be significant uh, in a little while because this would indicate that you can have views at condition score three and a half uh, or anything above three and a half and you, and you start losing uh, lambs to, to dystochia whereas the individual animal analysis doesn't, so, doesn't really show that. Uh, but and, thi and this, it, this, this plot level information showed that that twin lamb survival continued to increase to, to the highest level that was was measured in the in the trial, and, and I think that fits in with with most people's expectation, and it certainly fitted in with the uh, with the merino information. Th these are the um, the coefficients associated with the impacts or the, what was measured as far as U nutrition and live weight change during pregnancy and the effects on birth weight and the effects on, on weaning weight. And it's comparing the, the merino figures with the, with the maternal figures combined across 2014, 2015. And it's showing that there's a similar response for maternals as to merinos. Uh, the maternals are, the numbers are a little bit smaller, which is indicating that the, that the U is buffering what's happening to the lamb more than the merino does. So if you change live weight, uh, so take the last period, the late pregnancy is the most sensitive time, that less nutrition to a maternal U in late pregnancy has less effect on birth weight than it has on a, on a merino. Then you add that to the fact that the maternal lamb is less sensitive to birth weight than the merino lamb and, you've, and you're building a picture that that maternal genotype is, is more robust than the merino genotype. And, and again, that's exactly what you probably all expect. It's just that we now have some numbers on it so that we can do some, some good feed budgeting and help decide what's the best way to feed, uh, to feed these animals. The, the other bit of information is that we've, we've now got some information to quantify the effects of U nutrition during pregnancy on, on weaning weight. And we certainly expect that, that weaning weight is much more important for uh, maternal, and, or maternal lambs than it is for merino lamb because you want to turn off the maternal lamb and for most merino lambs you're keeping them uh, at least through to their hogget shearing before they're culled. Uh, but these effects of ewe nutrition are actually um, on weaning weight are actually quite small and, and what this graph is showing you is, is differentiating the effect of ewe nutrition on weaning weight that's the difference between the solid line and the, the dotted line is, is a ewe that's um, 6 kilos heavier at, at lambing and the difference between the, the red and the green is, is the the birth type of the lamb, and the slope of the line is the impact of um, is the impact of food. So you're seeing that the difference between a single and a twin is around six six and a half kilos difference between a, a twin-born lamb raised as a twin and a single raised as a single. Uh, there's about a three kilo effect of being at at uh, 500 kilos of food through lactation and being at sort of one and a half to, to two tonnes and there's about a, a one and a half kilo effect of um, or sorry a one kilo effect of having to use six kilos heavier um, so again th I think those effects probably line up with with what people expect but it gives us a set of numbers that we can put into the feed budgeting we also just to give you a few more numbers, if you're interested in numbers, the, the effects of a, that, that's the effect of a twin raised as a twin, and a, a twin raised as a single is around three kilos lighter than a single raised as a single. A triplet raised as a, a single is about six kilos lighter. A, a triplet raised as a twin is around nine kilos lighter, and a triplet raised as a triplet is about 11 kilos lighter. So, so it means that those triplet born lambs are quite light, quite difficult to, to, to finish. And again, this is just painting the picture that, that, the, um, that the maternal type sheep is, is more robust than the merino. We see that there's three kilos difference 
is the, the slope of the line and in a merino there's there's about four and a half kilos different so if you're underfeeding the the maternal it's having less effect on on weaning weight than than underfeeding the the uh, the merino so some of the other the, the food targets that were uh, or food benchmarks that were measured in the uh, in that on-farm phase and and in the second phase the maternals uh, step back a bit the the reason that that we found that or the reason that was found that the maternal type sheep that we couldn't do the feed budget for them came down to the fact that they they consumed about 25 percent more feed than was being estimated in the feeding standards so their maintenance requirement was about the same uh, or not statistically different between from what we measured to what was predicted but there also did seem to be uh, an impact that the maternal type sheep was putting on more protein and less fat than is predicted by the, the feeding standards. But we didn't really, ha we haven't got enough information yet to, to prove that that was the case. And that was because there was variation between the two sites that, that measured that. At the Hamilton site, there was not much difference between the feeding standards and, and what was measured. And at the Catanning site, um, there was quite a big difference between what was measured and, and what was predicted. So we suspect that there's a, a genotype effect on partitioning into to fat and protein, and that makes a lot of sense to me. There's been a lot of selection going on in the, um, in the meat industry to have a, a fast-growing meaty lamb, so it makes a lot of sense that that has moved over and we've now got a a very meaty ewe that's putting on a lot more protein and, and less fat than the animals that were measured back in the days when they came up with the, with the feeding standards. Um, that does have some effect on the, on the feed budget uh, because if you put on protein, it's, as we know with a, with a growing lamb, it's a lot cheaper to put on a kilo of, of protein. The problem when we come round to the, to the to the mature animal in that flock, in this case the, the ewe, there's a lot less energy there when they come to, to losing weight as well. So they put it on quickly, but they also lose it more quickly. So, so there is some significance to partitioning when you start looking at the, at the adult, and, and it's not good to be partitioning into protein as an adult, but it is good to be partitioning into protein as a, as a lamb. So there's, I think there's a bit of, um, thinking to be done about how that moves into the breeding objectives and, and how we measure it and how we breed for it in a, in a, in a system. The other bit that was found at, at straw and when, when grazing pastures was that the maternal intake, or the intake of the maternal sheep is less sensitive to, to low f levels of feed on offer than, than merinos, and again, I think that's no surprise to everybody. Most people expect that the, that the maternal type sheep graze harder than, than the merino. Um, we've just now got, got some numbers and, and they were grazing around. The, the impact of low foo was about uh, a third of, uh, so they, they reduced their intake by about a third less than the merino reduces their intake on low foo. So we found that the, uh, a twin bearing ewe in late pregnancy could maintain with a foo of around 400 to 600 uh, kilos per hectare. The, uh, sorry, a single, oh yep, so 400 to 600 to maintain a twin bearing ewe in late pregnancy and, and if they had 800 to 1000 kilos on offer they could be gaining 200 to 300 grams per head per day. So. So those animals are, are capable of putting weight on uh, on relatively low levels of, of feed. And, and the amount of food that you needed to offer them in, uh, in pregnancy depended on the condition score of the ewe. So condition score sort of two and a half, you needed about a tonne to the hectare to, to maintain during lactation. If those animals were, were heavier going into uh, lambing, then you might need anything up to, to two tonnes to the hectare to maintain through lactation. One of the other side things that was found that if, 
If uh, the U's varied by a, a condition score at the previous joining and they were fed together or run together from previous joining to next joining, by the next joining those animals would only differ by about a quarter of a condition score. So, so the, the, the skinny animals are, are able to, to catch up and they're able to catch up quite quickly um, with, with their better fed counterparts. So all that information, we've, we've then taken that to um, move on to look at how do we put, how do we put that information into a, into a system that, that gets the most profit, profitability out of a maternal genotype. So we've, we've, we've done some whole farm modelling uh, using the MIDAS um, optimization, bioeconomic optimization model. The, it was carried out for, for two different regions. Um, both in southern Australia, one down in Hamilton in a, in a nine month growing season and evaluated three times of lambing, sort of April, June and, and August lambing and then two times of lambing in the Great Southern in, in Western Australia, which was a six month growing season. So both of these are, are Mediterranean type environments with sort of winter wet and summer dry. The, the genotype evaluated was a, a composite U genotype mated to a terminal sire um, with ewes being bought in at, uh, at 18 months of age so we weren't mating ewe lambs just um, adults and the genotype was 65 kilos mature weight 140% uh, number of lambs weaned and cutting around two and a half kilos of, of 13 micron, uh, 30 micron wool. So the, the analysis included the production information that was outlined in the previous slides and we calculated the profitability for the optimum ewe nutrition profiles and, and looked at the sensitivity of those profiles if we varied meat um, over a range of, was sort of average at $6.50 but varied between $4.30 uh, and $8.60 and a grain price which you'd probably be quite happy to have nowadays at $275 a tonne, but ranging between $185 and, and $365. So the, the findings about the optimum profile was that, um, that the condition score target at, at lambing is, is the most important target. That didn't really, it didn't vary between regions, didn't vary with time of lambing, didn't vary with meat price, didn't vary with grain price. So, so that was quite a, a robust target. Condition, around condition score three for, for lambing for single bearing ewes and around three to three and a half for twin bearing ewes at, at lambing. There was more variation about the condition score at joining and, and the general conclusion was that the, the, con the target for the condition score at joining was whatever would be volunteered in the environment you're in with the stocking rate that you're running um, provided that you could achieve the lambing targets without having excessive weight loss. So that meant that if, if you were having a bump of spring and your ewes were going to get to condition score four and a half, then, then that would be hard to get back to, to these sort of condition scores. So best to ration them pre-joining. Um, it also meant that if you're in a late lambing system, so you were joining well after the peak live weight, then it was profitable to feed your ewes to maintain them up closer to condition score 3.8 to, to 4, rather than let them drop back in that um, period prior to joining. Um, the, this excessive weight loss during pregnancy to, to achieve these condition scores if, if the ewes were mated at, at a high condition score because the measurements in the trial indicated that on relatively short feed still uh, the, the maternal ewe can gain a lot of weight post weaning and so getting to condition score four, four and a half was, was something that was, was quite achievable, quite likely to happen. Um, so the the, the managing of the weight loss in that um, 
early pregnancy period was, was important to, to achieving the targets. What we found that we didn't know enough about was what's the impact of, of weight loss or what is, what is excessive weight loss that causes mortality in ewes and, and what is the target that, that leads to increased risk of dystochia. And we talked a bit about the dystochia before and, and that, the, that we had some disagreement with the statistical model. So we've put an extra uh, weighting on dystochia to, that, that's having an effect on, on, these, um, on these outcomes. When we compared the profitability of the, the optimum maternal profile with the, with the lifetime new management profile that was, was to maintain weight from joining to, to lambing, we found that the, the, the new recommendations were, were sort of seven to eleven dollars per ewe more would, would increase profitability for the maternal producer by seven to eleven dollars per ewe. Um, and, and that was reasonably consistent across region and time of lambing, but what actually drove that difference in seven to eleven dollars actually varied quite a lot between regions. So this is the, this is the contributing factors to that change in profitability. The blue bar is, is stocking rate and supplement, so that's the feed budget. The, the orange bar is um, ewe sale value and ewe mortality. The, the uh, grey bar is weaning percentage. The little blue bar is, the light blue bar is weaning weight and the dark blue bar is ewe wool production. So the, the story is that the, the answer is consistent across regions and time of lambing, but the reason for the answer actually varies quite a lot between region and time of lambing. Um, and, and I haven't got enough time to, to, to go into some of those re reasons, but we see that with early lambing, it's a lot more about the, the feed supply, and with the later lambing, it's, it's more about um, ewe mortality and, and weaning percentage. <coughs> So, so a question that, um, that comes up is about differential management of singles and twins. So the, um, those targets of condition score three for singles at lambing and condition score three, 3.3 to 3.5 for twins, they can't be concurrently achieved if you're managing your singles and twins together. So, so the message really is that, that um, that scanning the maternal breeds is important and we think at this stage it's more important than, than scanning uh, in a merino flock, but that's, that's, that's a subject to a, to a project that's gonna be carried out sometime between now and Christmas time. As I mentioned, the, the assumptions around new mortality did have an effect on, on survival, uh, sorry, on the, on the optimum profile but we don't at this stage know enough about those, so we've made some, some best estimates of how much weight single and twin bearing ewes can lose, um, and, and they were the, these were the assumptions, that singles can lose 0.7, or singles and twins can lose 0.7 of a condition score in early pregnancy, singles can lose a further 0.6 in late pregnancy, um, and that multiple should be maintained. So the take home messages are, that the lambing is the key target. Condition score three for singles, 3.3 to 3.5 for, for twins. And the condition score for joining is, is whatever's volunteered at your stocking rate uh, in seasonal conditions, provided you can hit those targets. And, and you have to scan in order to be able to do it.